Rough and Tumble Play with Tom Golden. Men are good. Rough and Tumble Play is something that boys love. In fact, girls love it too, but boys really not only love it, they need it. Jak Panksepp has taught us about that, and it's fascinating stuff. You know, Panksepp was the first to isolate the seven emotional systems in the brain. One of those systems is the system of play, and he found that uh, this same system of play is in all mammals. Fascinating, eh? It's in all mammals. I mean, we are geared to play, not because we learn how to do it, but because we are born with it. And usually the play that happens in childhood has to do with teaching us how to become better adult whatevers. You know, the garfish, for instance, they, they play by jumping over uh, sea turtles. And what they found is that they're practicing really evasive skills later in life that they're, they'll need when they're trying to get away from predators. And lions, I mean, they, they bat around, the cubs bat each other around. They're learning how to be predators, basically. So, you know, we tend to learn how to do things when we play, and boys and girls are no different. You know, the, the boys tend towards coalitional play uh, with larger teams, and the girls tend towards a smaller person uh, play, the play parenting kinds of stuff. And both are kind of learning what, for thousands and thousands of years, they've needed to learn in order to become adults. It's interesting stuff, play. And Panksepp has done some absolutely mind-blowing work on this with rats. He found out that rats, particularly male boy rats, love to play. Now, how did Panksepp figure out that male rats love to play? It's pretty interesting, really. He, they allowed the rats to only be in certain areas to play. Then they'd put springs on the tails of the rats and gauge how hard they would struggle to get into that area where they could play. What they found was the rats really struggled. They really wanted to play. And they stretched those springs. And another thing that's interesting is that they found that play is like, uh, it's like hunger in a way. When, you're, when you don't eat for a while, you get hunger and hunger. When you don't play for a while, you want it more and more and more. Man, I can remember when I was a little guy in elementary school and I'd have to sit there quiet and just, ugh, it was terrible. I'd, I needed to do something. So I'd take a little piece of paper and ball it up like that and pew, you know, try and hit John, my buddy, two rows over, right? And he'd laugh and I'd laugh and I'd feel better for just a second, right? Yeah, short lived, but what the hell? But that's this need to play is there, particularly when you're not having it for a while. You, you, you've got to get a fix. Our boys needed a fix anyway. So Panksepp's got these male rats, and he is putting uh, springs in their tails to find out you know, how much they want to play. And finally, he lets them into the place to play. And how do male rats play? Well, they wrestle. I mean, they really wrestle. They try and knock each other over, and they jump on each other, and they push each other around until the win is when you can pin. You know, when one rat gets on top of the other, and the other is on his back. That's a pin. And whoever pins, he's the winner. And the winner then becomes the dominant. And the loser becomes the subordinate. And from that point forward, the subordinate rat has to come and ask to play with the dominant rat. You know, have you ever seen animals, particularly dogs, you know, they, they, when they want to play, they'll kind of, you know, they're <laughs> like that. Well, that's what the subordinate rat has to do um, to the larger rat and very well, he's the larger rat they like to play. And so he'll start playing again. They'll wrestle and they'll wrestle and wrestle. And actually, they'll go on for a number of pins, you know, and they they found, they watched. And here's a really fascinating thing they found, that the dominant rat would allow the sub rat to win at least 30% of the time. Because if he didn't allow him to win 30% of the time the less dominant rat would quit playing. <laughs> and the, the, the dominant rat wants to play, right? So he lets him win, and they keep playing. Isn't that fascinating? You know, Jordan Peterson talks about this very thing, and he says, this is the sign of an emergent ethic of reciprocity in animals. From rats are, are, have this ethic of allowing another rat to win in order for the game to continue. Fascinating, eh? So they did some things with these rats. And one of the things they did was 
They disallowed the rats to have any kind of rough and tumble play. They stopped them from having play. What do you think happened? When they stopped the rats from playing, the rats developed problems with their prefrontal uh, cortex. And uh, they developed symptoms that were not unlike uh, human symptoms of ADHD. So they gave the rats some Ritalin. Ritalin. And they got better. But Panksepp found out something else. And this is devastating. He found out that the reason they got better was because the Ritalin suppresses the instinct to play. Ooh, the Ritalin suppresses the instinct to play. You know, I've heard parents talk about uh, their boys when they're on, on ADHD meds. I will say, gosh, he's not as playful as he used to be. And that's why they don't want to play anymore. Ay, ay, ay. And it's the very thing that boys need. You know, boys need this play in order to develop. In order to not have a, a prefrontal cortex problem. You know, in some, in the severe cases of ADHD, apparently there are uh, the same kinds of problems that they saw in those rats. So rats and us are not too far apart, eh? But anyway, it's fascinating to see that the... Um, Aggression in rats, this this play, did what? One of the things it did was it kept the rats from being aggressive later in life. Fascinating, eh? In fact, there is some evidence that the same thing happens in humans. There's uh, Panksepp, one of God, one of the quotes in Panksepp's book, The Archaeology of Mind. He says, It has been noted that pathological aggression follows a childhood marred by a dearth of playfulness. Brown, 1998. Think about that. Pathological aggression follows a childhood that doesn't have enough play. Huh. How about that? So here we've got childhood problem of ADHD. And what do we do? We pump them with drugs that make them not want to play when play is exactly what's needed for them to develop and to be human beings. We know that now. We know that the rough and tumble play with fathers is a big part of boys' development. Kids love this stuff. Oh my gosh. I knew this uh, teacher. Big guy. He was like 6'8". Huge. And by 250, 260. Who knows how big he was. But he had this this elementary school class, <laughs> and they, the, he was beloved teacher, and they gave him the worst students in the entire school. I mean, they gave him the worst, the whole. And so it was a challenge for him, right? He tried everything. He tried being nice. He tried, you know, being funny. He tried, didn't work. He tried ice cream. He tried candy bars. Nothing worked. They were still ornery and obnoxious and not doing any work at all in class. Well, one night by chance, they were in this room by themselves that had pillows and, and, uh, and um, um, couches and chairs, soft chairs and things like that. And that time, one of the little kids came up and attacked him. And he was just playing, right? He was like a dog playing. He comes up and he attacks him, paws him like that, right? And so... My friend just takes him off, throws him on the couch, right? There's nothing for him. All the kids saw that. They all wanted to do it. So they all came after him. One by one, he'd throw him off. He'd put him over his head and spin him around and then throw him on the couch. The kids absolutely loved this. They loved it so much. And he realized what he could do. And for that year, what he said was, okay, homework first. We're going to do this, this, and this, and then we're going to rumble with Randy. <laughs> they got their work done in order to go out and rumble because they absolutely loved it. And this is exactly what developmentally these kids needed. They needed that human touch. What happens in rough and tumble play? What happens is they learn the difference between aggression and play. Where's the difference between pain and play? And, you know, I'm sure these kids were doing things that he, he's not... Can't do that. So he would teach them as they go along how far to go, what not to do, right? 
This is instrumental for a child's social development, for a child's physical development, just to understand how to incorporate being a kid and being an adult without being aggressive. Rough and tumble play. Jeez, how about that? You know, Panksepp, here's another quote from Panksepp. Perhaps ADHD in children is sometimes an indication of a play-starved or especially robust play system rather than a sign of psychopathology. Critical quote. Sometimes maybe it's just that kids don't get to play enough or they've got too robust a play system. Not that it's pathological. Because we take these kids and we put them in school and we make them sit still. It's like me with the with the flick of the paper. I needed to do something. I needed to get out. And what do we do? We cut out recess. We cut out moving around. And we certainly cut out rough and tumble play, which is absolutely insane. You know, because now we know that rough and tumble play is indeed connected to later aggressiveness. You know, at least we're guessing that. And... Who is it that gives the rough-and-tumble play in families? I'll answer that. It's the dads. It's the dads that are there that teach these kids, both boys and girls, about the rough-and-tumble play and about how to tell the difference between aggression and play and how to not hurt someone but have a good time, how to get excited without hurting, right? It's the dads that teach this. So really, when you think about it, if this is correct, then it's the dads that keep these kids from being violent later in life. Okay? Then you look at something else. You look at most of the kids in... Most of the kids... Most of the people in jails, most of the men, the young men in jails, are fatherless. They never had a dad who was going to do rough-and-tumble play, who would teach them this kind of thing. It's the fatherless... The violent criminals haven't had dads. And yet, what do we have in today's psychological world but the idea of toxic masculinity, which implicates men in teaching our children how to be violent? It's the exact opposite. It's the men who help the children to not be violent. Toxic masculinity is absolutely insane. It's absolutely insane. Our psychological professionals are also insane. It's the fathers who keep the kids civil. It's the fathers who teach them how to be active and strong and, and play rough, but not be violent. And it's this teaching that helps people as they grow older not to be violent, to learn how to be able to play rough and have a good time. So, man, my heart goes out to fathers, you know, dads out there. Please keep playing with your kids, boys and girls. Keep throwing them up in the air. Keep tickling them. Keep keep roughhousing. Keep moving with them. Keep working them out. Because that's what's helping them to develop as adults. It's dads that are the answer. It says, Janice Fiamingo says, this is tonic masculinity, not toxic masculinity. And we all know the same thing. We all know that men are good, as are you. Like, subscribe, comment. Come see me on Subscribestar. I've got a, uh, I've got a Subscribestar platform now instead of the Patreon. I'll keep the Patreon for a while. But for those of you who want to get away from Patreon, come on and see me at Subscribestar and, and chip in a buck or two and find out what we're doing there. It's pretty interesting stuff. So you all take care. We'll see you. Men are good.